Good morning. It's good to see everybody out. Uh, I'd like to welcome our visitors. We have several, I've met several of the visitors, and we're very happy that, that you're here. Uh, this morning, I'd like to continue what we, we talked about with Brother Michael Hershey. Uh, if you have not have a chance to listen to those lessons that he presented, I would strongly encourage you to do so. They are excellent. Again, we, we, we kind of thought when he came, we were going to learn a little bit about singing, but we learned a lot more about worship and uh, the, the idea of worship. And I want to kind of continue along those theme, along those lines. I also want to talk a little bit about something that's coming up, and I'd like you to, to tie these two subjects together, and that is our, our study on authority. Uh, we're going to be starting that very shortly in one of our adult classes, and as we look at who our God is, and who the lamb is, then we need to think about our response to that. And that's what I'd really like to <clears throat> talk about today. And I appreciated that Jonathan led the song that he did, Worthy is the Lamb, because that's what we're going to be talking about. In Revelation chapter 5, we're going to be reading that. Revelation chapter 5. If you, uh, One of the things the elders have done, and I'll just take an aside here, is we put pew Bibles all along here, and uh, if you have a if you if you want to follow along the pew Bible, it's on page eighteen hundred and seventy nine. We have those same Bibles in the classroom, so hopefully we can all be together. And as, as we're we're reading things along here, that that'll help us in our study. Uh, as we as we look at this idea of worthy, and and we want to talk about that concept a little bit for all you high school students out there pretty soon, you'll be counted worthy of a, of a diploma. That is, you fulfill certain requirements. And once you fulfill those requirements, the school, the district has deemed you worthy to carry or to have this piece of paper certifying that you have completed the coursework that's necessary. When we think about the Heisman Trophy, we think of the person who wins that trophy. He has done something. He is worthy of that trophy. And why? Because maybe he blocked better than everybody else. But not only that, he had to, to outshine everybody else who was running and passing and everything else. So he accomplished something. There's something that's accomplished to be worthy of that. And as we look at Revelation chapter 5, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, before we get into that, I, I need to give a little bit of background on the book of Revelation. The, the book was written to Christians who were undergoing persecution. Uh, the Roman Empire had, had killed many Christians. They were persecuting others. They'd taken all they had. And people were wondering, where's God in all of this? What, what's what's going to happen to us? And so <clears throat> John sees Jesus, the risen Christ. And he doesn't see him as, as someone similar, someone simple in chapter one. He, he sees him as this awesome figure, and he falls down as one dead. And then the Lord walks among the lampstands, that is the seven churches, and he talks about each and every church, saying that, I know what you face. I understand the problems that you had. In chapter four, we have the great throne scene. And this is God upon his throne here. And he talked about the living creatures before that. And then the message is that God is in control. And in chapter 4 and verse 11, we see, Worthy art thou, our Lord and our God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they were and were created. God is worthy. But that brings us to our lesson today, and that is in chapter 5. We, we see, and we're, we're going to do some reading here. In chapter 5, verses <coughs> 1 through 5. <coughs> Excuse me. We see, then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, that is God, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. 
Now, when we look at this particular thing, we, we have the idea of the, of the, the uh, figurative language here. We have the idea of a lamb. We have the idea of a lion. As we look at this, we see this, this God has a, a scroll in his hand. Well, what does that mean? What that is, is the seals on the scroll are, are, are things that are open as God pours out his wrath upon the Roman Empire, upon the world. But this is the scroll represents God's will in a specific matter. And people want to know what God's will is, but nobody can open the scroll. Who can do this? Only the Lion of Judah. And so as we look at this, this idea that, that, that Jesus here is spoken of in a lion of Judah. Now, when you think about a lion and you think about this lion going to appear, what do you think of? You think ferocious. You think of danger. And you, you think of a lot of things that are not associated with a lamb. But as we go on here, look at, at Revelation chapter uh, 5, verse, verses 6 through 8. And between the throne... And the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. Well, explain to me if the lion of Judah is the one who's going to open the scroll, why does John show the picture of a lamb? And not only a lamb, but it's a lamb that had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saint. There's, there's, there's a, a problem here. We have the lion of Judah, but now then we see the lamb of God. And, and what does that mean? Well, I think what he's saying here is the idea that the, the Lion of Judah, <coughs> pardon me, the Lion of Judah is what the people would be familiar with, but why lamb? Again, we, as we look at Jesus' work, he's emphasizing the elements of sacrifice. The lamb, of course, would be very familiar to the Jews. The Jews would sacrifice the Passover lamb uh, every year, and uh, they would, uh, in the Exodus, they had to smear the blood of the lamb over the doorpost so that their firstborn was not affected. The Jews were very familiar with this. So the picture of a lamb emphasizes Jesus' sacrificial role. And he's also powerful. The, uh, Jesus is powerful. He's the Lion of Judah. But the text doesn't say he's worthy because of his power. It says he's worthy because of the sacrifice. He has sacrificed something. He represents the sacrifice that God made for us so that we could be, uh, we could be done. In the midst, this idea of in the midst of all these creatures, we have, and we didn't read chapter 4, but we have this throne room scene, we have these creatures around, we, we have some of the, the elders, we have this big convention, and Jesus is in the middle of it, in the midst of all this. He is the first among all present. He is the preeminent one. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the one that the emphasis is upon, and when we think about Jesus, we need to think about him having the preeminence and being in that particular position. What are the characteristics of this particular lamb? First of all, he is worthy to open the seals. And we talked about the idea of being worthy. To be worthy means to you've done something. To be worthy of something is you've done something which merits the fact that you can do something else. Jesus, the lamb, is worthy to open the seal. But again, this is not just a, simp a very simple lamb. Uh, this is not just a, a, a small sheep who is helpless. As we look in chapter 6, if you flip over there to chapter 6 and verse 16, we see this, ram, this, this lamb is capable of great wrath. And here the people are saying, uh, they say to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, that would be God, and from the wrath of the lamb. So hide us from God and his anointed one, because Judgment is coming. You need to understand that the wrath of the lamb, this lamb is not just a small little bleeding sheep. This lamb is powerful. He is the lion of Judah and capable of great wrath. And notice in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, what do the saved say about this lamb? It says, And after these things I saw, behold, the great multitude, which no man could number, out of every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the lamb, 
arrayed in white robes and palms in their hands, and they cry with a great voice saying, Salvation unto our God who sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. They attribute their salvation to the Lamb. So the Lamb is the one responsible for their salvation. The Lamb in chapter 13 and verse 8 is spoken of is with the books of the book of life. If our name is not written in the book of life, if the Lamb doesn't have our name in the book of life, we are lost. The Lamb is the one who has the power to write that name out or to blot that name out. And his name is on the servant's forehead. And, and, and that's a very special thing. In chapter 14 and verse 1, it's the name of the Lamb on the servant's foreheads. They're marked. In other words, he knows who his are. And in that horrible world, in all that they were undergoing, they could know that Jesus would say, you're mine. I know who you are. You have my mark on your forehead. In chapter 15 and verse 3, we read that it's his song, the song of the Lamb that is sung. The idea here that that, that this is the one, this is the one that that, that, uh, is worthy of this song. Uh, Jump back to to verse 6 here, if if you would. This idea, the the midst of the throne and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders, okay, as the lamb had been slain, having seven horns. In the Old Testament, the idea of horns was one of power. In other words, we talk about, God talks about cutting off the horn of the wicked. So that's his power. Uh, Here, the lamb is spoken of as having seven horns, seven being a perfect number. He has all power. This lamb is the one uh, uh, that I'm reminded of in Psalm chapter 2, which we, we talked about a little bit in our meeting, the idea that the, uh, it, it is the God's anointed who would break with a rod of iron the nations, it's, and, and he would laugh at those who come up against him. It's the idea of power, and this lamb is the one with the power. Uh, the idea of the seven eyes, a uh, passage that I think we're familiar with, uh, should give us a lot of comfort over in chapter uh Chapter 16 of 2 Chronicles, if you turn over there with me. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and again, if, you, if you're into memorizing Scripture, this is one, it's a, it's a really good one to memorize. It says, for the eyes of Jehovah run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The lamb sees. He has eyes everywhere, and that should give us comfort as well. He knows who we are, and he sees everything that we undergo, and his eyes are upon us. So that's a very comforting thought that we should have. He's the victor. In chapter 17, verses 13 and 14, we'll not take time to read, but Jesus is the victor. The lamb has won the battle, and the only question is, do we want to be on his side or do we want to be on the side of the enemy who will be defeated? This is the lamb that we're talking about. So now let's go ahead and, and uh, turn back to Revelation chapter 5. Verses, <clears throat> pardon me, verses 9 through 14. And they, speaking of this, this, these four living creatures and the 20 elders, they sing a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and did purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and madest them to be unto our God a kingdom of priests, and they reign upon the earth. And I saw and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a great voice, worthy is the Lamb that has been slain to receive the power and the riches and the wisdom and the might and the honor and the glory and the blessing. Every created thing which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things that are in them, heard I saying, unto him that sitteth upon the throne, that is God, and unto the Lamb be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. As we look at this passage here, we're not going to have time today to talk about all the the idea here. The the idea here that is, why is the lamb worthy? Well, he was slain, and and that's almost an understatement. 
as we think about it, all that goes into the death of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was slain. He was raised up the third day. He came, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us, that he, lead, he led the life of, of humility, and he humbled himself, emptying self of all his privileges of deity to die to death, and not just the death, but the death of the cross for us. He is worthy to open the seal. He purchased us unto God. And a key question that we have to face uh, is, how can the God of heaven be just? If he's going to be just, how can he forgive us? And Romans chapter 3 and verse 26 tells us that it's we're justified by faith, by the sacrifice of Christ, because this way he can be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20 tells us that we were bought with a price. We were bought with a price. We are not our own. And that carries certain responsibilities with it. And here, we, uh, this passage also talks about that we are a kingdom and priest unto our God. What is our job? We're not going to take time to talk about this in great detail, but we offer up sacrifices of praise. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. We also do good works. The works that Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that God afford prepared time. And as we talk about what well, I'd like to say the second half of this lesson, but it's going to be five minutes. We, we talk about the good things that God would have us to do. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, he told us what the good works are. We don't define the good works. He tells us what the good works are. And we belong to God. As, as we read about the eyes of him are on us, we know who he is and he knows who we are. 10,000 times 10,000 in this multitude of people in, those, in this thing that the Christians were facing, in this persecution that they were undergoing, they weren't alone. The God knows what it is. The heavenly host know what it is. We're not alone. And as we face the trials of life, we are not alone either. What is the land worthy of? And again, we read that he's worthy of blessings and honor and riches and wisdom and all the things listed in that. But then in our own lives, what can we say that the Lamb is worthy of? And how do we demonstrate in our lives that the Lamb is worthy? How do we show that we recognize the worthiness of the Lamb? A lot more than I can talk about in the next few minutes, but one thing I do want to talk about, and this comes back to what we were, we're going to have a class on, is the idea of authority. And brethren, on this class, it's something that I, I do not want to underemphasize. The eldership has talked a lot about this. The idea of understanding what authority is and what are the implications of God's authority. So as your friend, as your brother, as your elder, I would ask you to pay close attention to this, give careful consideration to the idea of authority that we'll be talking about and we'll just spend a few minutes on today. We recognize because the Lamb is worthy that He has all authority. That is, there's nothing left out. He can specify everything. As we look at God's Word, some people say that you know some parts are more important than others, and that's true. There are some commandments that are greater. That that the idea Jesus talked to the Pharisees. You know, you the, the idea of justice and mercy and love. They're very important. Not to say that the tithing is not important of mint, anise, and cumin but they're weightier matters in the law, but all of God's work is, is important. Let me ask you, we're not taking time to read it. As we think about God's law, what can you think about might be maybe the most unimportant thing you could find? Well, I, don't, I can't answer that question. Let me put a, a nominee up here. Leviticus chapter 19, and verse 27, don't round the corners of your beard. Now, what difference does that make? I mean, in the great scheme of things, is it immoral to round the corners of your beard? Uh, so what if I round the corners of my I like rounding the corners of my beard. Does it matter if I do that? What about tattoos? Now, this is the Old Testament, brethren. This, I'm not talking about today, but in the Old Testament, tattoos were something that the children of Israel were not allowed to have. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. What's the deal? Okay, I want to put something on my arm. I'm not hurting anybody. So I think it's a good idea. Is it? The type of fire offered, the idea of, and we'll take time to read this very quickly. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. It's a story where 
all familiar with. And this really talks about the why here, that we all, everything that we're talking about here. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took each of his censer and put fire therein and laid incense thereon and offered strange fire before Jehovah, which he had not commanded them. And there came forth fire from before Jehovah and devoured them, and they died before Jehovah. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is that Jehovah spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. What difference does it make whether you get fire out of a sensor over here or I strike a match and put it here? I mean, if, can, can you tell the difference if you look at two flames like that? No, you can't. God can. What is it? If, if By offering the strange fire, they were not sanctifying God. They were not setting God apart. They were not glorifying God. And if the Jew says, I'm going to round the corners of my beard, he's not sanctifying God. If we make decisions that... I think it's a good idea, then we're not sanctifying God. Uh, touching the ark, the idea of Uzzah, will not take time to read that. You're familiar with the story. Uzzah, the ark is being transported on a cart. It shouldn't have been. It should have been uh, handled by specific men using poles. The cart, the oxen stumbled. The ark was falling out. Uzzah tried to save it. He was doing what he thought was good. God struck him dead. And again, there's a whole sermon in that. Uh, David was upset, but he went back and studied what the law said, and he understood why it happened. Uzzah had not sanctified God. Uzzah had not glorified God because he had ignored God's authority. The proper view of God, in Job chapter 42 and verse 7, we have an interesting statement. At the end of the debate, we have Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and God appears in the whirlwind, and first of all, he, he sets Job straight. And Job confesses, I repent in dust and ashes. Then he turns to the three friends, and he says, you have not spoken right of me. My wrath is stirred. You better get Job to offer a sacrifice for you. Again, we don't have time to do it. I would ask you to go back and read the speeches of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they just say a whole lot of good things about God. They didn't say it all good. They missed the point. Understanding who God is is so important. And it's, again, it's a fact that we can't overemphasize. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, for us, you know, I don't like the, the, the speed limit. <laughs> just, I don't like it. You know, and, and, and the guy who did it, I'm not sure where he's coming from, but I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Well, what do you think? How about our practices concerning worship? John chapter 4, verse 24. The idea that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. I will say this, that even among my extended family, there are some sad cases of people who think they're worshiping God, but doing what they want to do. And, and they won't even discuss it. They won't even talk about it. Why? Because they know. They know, but they don't want to. Admit it. We need to be sure that we have authority for all we do. And when we recognize God's command, it's critical that we do what he says. And again, you might say, Howard, I know that. And we all do. The challenge, and please look, underline, underscore, in red, in bold, the challenge of the thought of authority is in the application. How do I apply this to the situations that we in this congregation face? How do I apply this in the situations that I face as an individual? How do I apply this principle as we look at our families? How do we apply this thing? This is critical because we must, as Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 3 says about God, he will be sanctified. We must sanctify God in our hearts, and we need to be sure that we glorify him. Our views of God, and there's really probably nothing more important than our view of God. Uh, there's there's another sermon at some point I'd like to preach. It's it's like we become what we worship. If we don't have the proper view of God, we're basically worshiping an idol, and, and that it, it boils down to that. But we become like what we worship. We need to be sure that our views of God, our understanding of His character, are correct. It's a growing process. 
But it starts with saying, I will do what God would have me to do regardless. It starts with recognizing the authority of God. And the reason, one of the reasons we recognize the authority of God is because the Lamb is worthy. Let us make sure that we can apply the principles here on authority. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it very much. Uh, we're now dismissed to our classes.